Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kira Proctor, and I'm the Manager Director here at the A. Proctor Group, and this is our 16th webinar of 2021. If you've missed any of the series which has been running since April 2020, you can go back and review them all on demand either here on our YouTube channel or on our Learning Hub at www.proctorgroup.com. If you would like CPD certification for today or any of our other sessions, you can also register for that, access product information or book in for a follow-up meeting with our team of experts, either online or in person. Today we are joined once again by a very special guest presenter, Stuart Little, CEO of IRT Surveys. Based in Dundee, IRT are specialists in optimising energy performance and upgrades of existing buildings. And Stuart will be discussing the use of these technical to drive smart, cost-effective retrofit projects. Before that, though, we'll take a minute to briefly review the background of today's retrofit requirement and some of the frameworks and documents involved in these projects. As usual, we'll finish up with a Q&A session where Stuart will be taking your questions alongside our team of experts. You can type questions into the YouTube chat box, DM us on Twitter at Proctor Group or drop us an email to webinar at proctorgroup.com. In terms of the UK's progress towards net zero, 2021 is notable for a number of reasons. The UK government in 2019 announced its intention to target net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. However, progress towards environmental targets have historically been slower than necessary. The UK is also hosting the COP26 conference in Glasgow this November, placing a global spotlight onto these efforts. The effects of lockdown and reduction in travel have also been significant, with the Committee on Climate Change, CCC, June 2021 progress report showing that UK CO2 emissions dropped by 13% in 2020 to almost half the 1990 emission baseline. Whilst this reduction and the conditions leading to it are unprecedented and unlikely not sustainable over the coming years, ensuring some of the positive changes are locked in and taking forward is an important component of building back better. Whilst transport related CO2 emissions have been hugely reduced and working from home and the reduced need for business travel seem likely to result in at least some degree of permeance there, progress on building stock has been less positive. The rate of insulation upgrade work in the UK peaked in 2012 and remains well below necessary levels, not least as the pandemic largely halted the retrofitting of occupied dwellings. The 2012 peak did, however, correspond with the end of the CERT assessed programmes of subsidised upgrade work, illustrating the potential of effective policy as a driver. Several programmes and frameworks are currently underway or under discussion with a view to boosting progress within the construction sector. Proposals are under construction across the UK regarding increasing efficiency of owner-occupied and privately rented housing to a minimum of EPC band C rating by the 2030s, and the Future Home Standard is due for introduction in 2025. We've discussed the Future Home Standard for new builds before in a webinar last year, which can be viewed on demand at our Learning Hub. On the retrofit side, there is also the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, a spiritual successor of sorts to CERT and CESP, announced as a demonstration in 2020. SHDF aims to increase efficiency across the socially rented sector to at least EPC band C, and to date a budget of over 200 million has been allocated to its delivery. There are three key principles of the SDHF's first wave of projects. Lessons learned from the delivery of these will then be incorporated into future waves of the project. Worst first. Firstly, the project is structured such that a scaled cost cap allows for greater spending on properties with the lowest EPC bands. This reflects the greater challenges that are often present in low performing properties. A common feature of these types of dwelling are solid or otherwise hard to treat wall constructions, which regular viewers of our webinars may remember we've covered previously. Our range of space therm aerogel insulation systems are ideal for space efficient thermal upgrades of these types of property. Fabric first. The fabric first approach to construction is based on ensuring heat loss from the dwelling is minimised as far as possible prior to the application of other energy efficiency measures. Targeting upgrades in this way ensures a solid foundation is laid for future upgrade works to build on. Taking this approach would, for example, prioritise effective thermal insulation, air leakage prevention and quality glazing over lower carbon heating systems. 
Systems such as our space therm are very effective in this approach, as their minimal thickness allows for the insulated envelope to be as continuous as possible around doors and window reveals, and within areas with limited space. Our wrap-tight vapour permeable air barrier system can also be combined with insulation upgrades to deliver reduced air leakage rates without compromising the moisture transfer characteristics of the structure. Lowest regrets. The final principle is that any approach taken should seek to minimise the potential that any measure installed will require replacement on the way to meeting the net zero target. This means nothing should be undertaken as a simple stopgap measure and it should be possible for any future work to build on what is done now. Based on these principles, the scheme aims to reduce the number of social rental tenants in fuel poverty. In England and Wales, this is defined as having a household income below the poverty line after energy costs and higher than average energy costs for the dwelling type. In the rest of the UK, a simpler definition of spending 10% of household income on energy is used. The target of EPC Band C will reduce the energy costs and thus aims to reduce fuel poverty whilst at the same time reducing the dwelling CO2 emissions. This is the second stated SHDF aim and improving the comfort, health and well-being of tenants, which is another of the aims. The last aim of the fund is to boost economic resilience in response to COVID by supporting jobs and industries via a green recovery. In order to ensure a best practice approach to upgrade works, SHDF funded projects must use the PAS 2035 specification, which details the steps, assessments and risks associated with each stage of the process, from assessment and design through to completion and handover. It specifies requirements in the following areas. Assessment of dwellings for retrofit, identification and evaluation of improvement options, design and specification of energy efficiency measures, EEMs, and the monitoring and evaluation of retrofit projects. The ultimate aim of the standard is to ensure projects deliver a healthy and fit for purpose environment for the occupants, whilst respecting any preservation considerations. This makes its principles a great fit with the aims and principles of the SHDF. Our refurbishment webinar, which can be found on our learning hub, goes into a lot more detail about PAS 2035 and how it can be applied to domestic refurbishment projects. What is critical across all of these approaches and measures is developing a solid understanding of the performance levels before and after upgrade works. Not least because the as designed theoretical or ADT conditions, which are assessed in the calculation methods, may not match the as built in service or ABIS conditions as well as would be ideal. So it's important that the fabric performance is properly and thoroughly assessed to ensure the buildings are not only performing as intended post upgrade, but also to understand what we are dealing with during the design stage. And with that in mind, we'll now pass over to Stuart for today's guest presentation. Good morning. Welcome to the presentation. Uh, my name is Stuart Little. I'm the CEO of IRT Surveys. That's IRT Thermographic Surveys. Uh, just going to walk you through about 18 slides, a quick introduction to who we are as a company, the history, the partners, focus on a couple of case studies as to what we're, we've been doing recently. But essentially, the, the, the company has been around for about 20 years, primarily known for two things. One is thermal surveys, which I'm going to touch on in the coming slides, and more recently, our devotion to energy software. So let me just walk you through a couple of slides. This is our team. Uh, the picture at the top is my brother and I uh, winning a Vibes Award many moons ago, uh, which is the vision in business for the environment of Scotland. The long-suffering Jane, uh, she's the company secretary, has been with us for 16 years. And just over my shoulder is James, who's our chief analyst, who's been with us for 15 years. At the bottom, you'll see the board advisors. Paul Hallis is ex-Centrica uh, Management. Dave Jones is the chap behind uh, computer games like Lemmings, Grand Theft Auto, David Beckham Soccer. He's won a couple of BAFTAs. Um, and he's now one of the directors of Epic Games over in Carolina and is working on the Fortnite uh, franchise. Debbie is a venture capitalist. She works for Shackleton, uh, a fairly, fairly small investors who describe themselves as 
second round investors in first class companies. Uh, they've been our VC since about 2012, I think. Philip Selwood is the ex-CEO of the Energy Saving Trust and has been with us for a couple of years. And Jenny Danson joined us in the middle of the uh, lockdown as a board advisor. So Jenny and I haven't actually met yet, but she's been an advisor uh, just helping us. She's got a strong um, social housing background amongst other things. So in our 20 years, we have now thermal imaged about 350,000 um, houses. 99% of them have been social housing. Uh, we tend to get instructed to do entire portfolios at a time. So it's a very low cost service. Uh, we've, we've managed to automate an awful lot of the, the systems and process and the analysis around it. So it's, um, it's a pretty cost effective way to do a stock condition survey. Our DREAM software, that's the Dynamic Retrofit Energy and Asset Management Platform. That now has about half a million um, social houses hosted on it. And I'll touch on that later, but essentially what it does is, is help roadmap the journey to net zero. Post Grenfell, we have done an awful lot of um, drone surveys on high rise buildings to establish the condition of cladding, look for fire breaks, uh, try and establish um, pathways for, for fire, flames and what have you. Had done an awful lot of commercial buildings as well, schools, colleges, hospitals, uh, office blocks, that kind of thing. Tend to be instructed by uh, building surveyors and local authorities in that regard. Some of our partners along the bottom, uh, some you, you will hopefully recognise. Uh, Renfrew Shower Council, for example, we've done, uh, oh cracky, five, six thousand thermal images for them. Uh, Glasgow City Council, we flew drones down their streets. I'm just about to touch on that. Recently, we joined the Retrofit Academy's um, Centre for Excellence. Um, Shift uh, is a standard for housing associations to achieve. Uh, we work with housing associations collaboratively with Shift. And Thesis are a group of 1,200 uh, global energy consultants around the world. We are partnered with them. They recommend our software. We're members of the Green Finance Institute. Um, I personally sit on a couple of steering groups with the Coalition of Energy Efficient Buildings, working on things like building passports, green rental agreements. Uh, a little while ago, we became tech partners of the RICS as well. So quick case study of thermal imaging. You're actually looking at a thermal image of the Scottish Parliament there. And just, just to explain what the colours mean before I move on, they basically, when you switch on a thermal camera, it has a look around the subject and it says, look, the, the warmest thing I can see is 15 degrees. I'll make white 15. The coldest thing I can see is the sky. I'll make it black. The sky might be minus 30. And it basically divides the rainbow across that, um, that level, that span. And you then fine tune the image to, to go searching for the things you're interested in. So the image of the parliament there, the red up around the, the parapet at the main entrance, that is like, it's either hot air coming out of the fabric or more likely it's moisture getting into the cladding system. Uh, but it's fairly meaningless when you get down to the bus shelter. You can see two people um, sitting in the bus shelter, little white dots. Um, they're obviously hot, they're about 36 degrees. Um, but you can see that there's various things you can, you can glean from the photographs if you look at them long enough. And they're not called photographs, by the way. They're called thermograms. Thermographers hate the word photographs for some reason. So if you consider drone technology, that's fairly a uh, hot topic. Uh, it's been in the media for all sorts of bad reasons, you know, hanging around nuclear power stations and airports and what have you. But done properly and safely, it's a, it's a fantastic tool to go and do uh, big building surveys very, very quickly and very safely. So we have CAA pilots that are legally allowed to fly almost anywhere within reason, uh, within about five meters of the facade of a, a structure. They're not allowed near railway lines. They're not allowed near nuclear uh, facilities, uh, power stations and what have you. And they're not allowed near airports. However, we have surveyed buildings right at the end of um, Glasgow runway, almost, with special caveats and special permissions. We've flown down Whitehall, uh, surveying buildings in London. Uh, we've, we've done extensive surveys with thermal imaging, but this case study is a specific one in Glasgow. It's in Nicola Sturgeon's uh, constituency. 
And what what started the whole process was being at the Scottish Parliament and listening to a chap uh, called Gavin Slater talking about them trying to roll out electric vehicle charging through the lampposts. However, there's insufficient headroom in the national grid to be able to drive home from work, plug your car in, put the oven on, put the kettle on and sit and watch TV. The national grid comes within about 5% of falling over every year because the more gadgets we buy, the more power they consume. So we basically pitched them an idea to say, look, if we can show you how to make the buildings 10 or 20% more energy efficient, would that help you with the EV charging uh, conundrum? The answer was yes. And that was the that was the catalyst. Now, when we when it spread around the council that that's what we were doing, more and more building surveyors got involved and said, look, whilst you're doing it, it'd be nice to know the condition of the chimneys. Are the satellite dishes held on with the requisite number of bolts? Are the, is there anything dangerous? Are there any fixings up there that could uh, fall off and, and hurt someone? What's the profile of the gutters? How much lead has been stolen? Is the apex okay? Are the ridges all right? Are the gables sound? So it kind of grew arms and legs. But what we delivered um, was a fairly comprehensive digital um, interactive reporting format with 80 megapixel visual photographs, really high res um, thermals, all the thermal images quantified uh, and broken down. So it was a condition report, it was an energy audit, but it started with a, an EV request. Did take a while to do, took about 500 hours of, of flight time, all incident free, uh, thankfully. Uh, we, we had the occasional person shouting at us, but in, in general, the public were, were really receptive. They were all written to and advised it was happening and, and asked not to throw things at the drone. They were reassured we weren't spying on them or doing anything nefarious. Um, the key benefit, the, the reason I started um, IRT 20 years ago, I, I spent five years in architecture designing buildings and specifying what type of product would be in situ, what, what, what should, should the thing be built of. But then I subsequently was made redundant and spent five years working for a flat roofing and roof garden uh, company. Uh, so the architects were called PAR, the PAR partnership, if you're Scottish and remember them. The flat roofing company were called Bowder. Uh, Bowder are Germany's biggest waterproofing manufacturer. So my time with Bowder, I, I kind of quickly realized that getting an architect to specify something is only actually part of the battle and it doesn't it doesn't give you any reassurance that that's physically what's going to be on site, particularly with design and build contracts and equal and approved status on a, a specification or a tender. So I realized when I was working with Bowder that because we'd specified it didn't mean that a contractor or a subcontractor wouldn't change it. So we basically I, I, I saw how hard it was to ensure that spec wasn't broken in the in the supply chain. Realized that with a thermal image you could actually um, take pictures of things, thermograms, and see the true condition of the fabric. So for instance the picture you're looking at now if you'd said, I want that cavity filled, I want it completely filled from top to toe, you've paid the bill, the contractor said he's done it. If you boroscope it at waist height, you'll see it's well insulated. But the thermal image shows you that the green bit is well insulated, it's colder, and the red bit is uninsulated, it's warmer. So it's a really, really good, fast, efficient way to say, you haven't done that properly, do it again. Uh, there's lots of houses at the moment with that sort of predicament. And in fact, of the 350,000 houses we've surveyed, we find about a third of homes are uninsulated, a third are well insulated, and a third are poorly insulated. So of the of the 50%, sorry, of the 100% that have been done, about 50% have been badly done. Uh, sometimes we find the front's been done, but not the gable. The front and gable are okay, but the back's not been done. Um, and sometimes we find things like this where it's just half full. That's the optimist, half full. Back in 2006, we raised venture capital and we basically worked for about a year to write an algorithm that turns pixels into pounds. So at the moment, we're the only guys in the world that can say, look, that house on the right is wasting that much money, that much carbon and that much CO2. That's what's going out to the environment every year, every year right at the front elevation. Whereas the house on the left, 
that's fully insulated and it's operating really well. The circular black things you're seeing are satellite dishes. The vertical stripe is our rainwater pipe dividing the two houses. Uh, the upper floor windows on the left, the black, that looks colder than the grey below because the windows are reflecting the sky because the ground, the photograph was taken at ground level. I said picture again, didn't I? Thermogram, sorry. But that's basically angle of incidence, angle of reflection. The, the windows above always look uh, colder. You can see some of the insulation spilling over from the house on the left over into the house on the right, just past the rainwater pipe on the upper floor. Um, but that the, the reason we wrote that software was Aberdeen City Council. So we, we did 5,000 thermal images for Aberdeen, delivered the images back in 2003, puffed out our chests, we're all excited about how good the images were. And the reaction was, they're really nice, thank you very much boys, but they don't really tell us that much, they're just pretty pictures. So we raised venture capital, we came back to Aberdeen and said, look, we can now quantify them, what do you think? And we did the rest of the portfolio, we did about 30,000 more houses and delivered uh, what you can see in front of you. We basically gave them a ranked and rated spreadsheet that showed uh, best to worst in, in a uh, empirical way that's that's irrefutable. The reaction then was, that's much, much better, but what you've done is very accurately describe, we definitely have a headache, what's the aspirin? And that led us on to what I'm, I'm, I'll touch on. That, that aspirin for us is, is, is the DREAM software. If you're a portfolio manager, an asset manager, and you're trying to make sense of your assets and actually make decisions uh, that would affect the, the, the whole net zero journey, and you want to do that optimally, you have to understand the nuances of RHI funding, LA Flex funding, uh, SHDF funding, ISH legislation, SAP uh, requirements, uh, not to mention all your other KPIs that, that are driving the business, the political stuff. So, uh, and all these all these factors, they're in constant motion. It never ever stays long enough, stays still long enough for anyone to actually get uh, experienced at it and good at it. And even within things like Eco, Eco 3 in my time has changed from uh, Eek, Eek 2, then Eco 1, 2, 2T, 3, and next year it changes to 4. And it's the, the nuances therein, if you only experience Eco 3, when it changes to Eco 4 next year, you'll be missing out on, on, on an awful lot of grant funding if you're unaware of it. So we basically, if you picture it like a, a Venn diagram of there's all the legislation, there's all the funding requirements, and there's your asset portfolio. What our DREAM software does is help you find that, that sweet spot in the middle where everything overlaps. So I'll give you a real life example of SHDF in practice. SHDF, for those of you who don't know, is the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. It was in 2020 a £50 million pound pot of money uh, looking for demonstrator projects. We put forward a consortium with our friends at Aberdeen City Council. We pulled in various partners who could bring funding and who could physically bolt things onto buildings. Uh, and we put forward a, a bid we were successful, we're one of 19 uh, projects in the country. But the, the, the bullet points are down the side here. What we essentially did was put Aberdeen's entire portfolio on DREAM. Uh, the grant's paying for that for three years. It's 90 pence a house. That aggregated all their data, pulled in things like the EPC register. Um, we re-ran all the SAP calculations, all the EPCs, sanitized it, cleansed it, mapped it, modeled it, and created an energy roadmap for each individual house. Then uh, we worked with Aberdeen City Council to say, look, of those 22,000, which 500 would you be most interested in fixing? So the software said, look, there are four pockets of 500. Uh, which one is the most important? Because they can all hit the, the Bayes criteria of 50 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter. So all the partners along the bottom had an opinion. Aberdeen had certain ish failure houses that they were keen to bring up to, to code. SMS are a, a Scottish based company who are co-investors in the project. They um, are paying for 
and installing PV batteries, air source heat pumps on the project. So they had a very specific criteria in terms of you know south facing orientation uh, and the structural integrity of the roof to take uh, the load of PV. And Switchy partnered us. There are IoT providers. If you've not seen Switchy before, please go and Google them. They're a great, great company, great innovation. But it is, essentially, it's a, it's a, it's an IoT sensor that monitors things like temperature, humidity, um, CO2. But it can also control the heating system. But it also is a bit like an iPad on a wall and gives you a two-way communication channel with the tenant. So you can say things like look, uh, please turn your thermostat up or we've got a, a, an engineer coming tomorrow. Is 12 o'clock still OK for you? Uh, that kind of thing, because getting access into social housing can be quite uh, quite tricky. Once we had the, the 500 refined, we chose uh, 250. There was another uh, filtration process. We selected 250. We then engaged with um, owners. So I, IRT thermal imaged 500. Sorry, I should have said that. We thermal imaged 500 just to see, look, are those cavities full? Are they half full? Do they need extracted? Then we pulled that down to 250. Then we wrote to 250 um, residents, asked if they would like uh, £55,000 worth of investment in their house. 100 people either came back and said no thanks or didn't engage. 150 said, yes, please, where do I sign? We then did um, EPCs, IRT did EPCs. We did retro retrofit assessment with a trained retrofit coordinator. And we then did 10 archetypes fully. We did 750 pound surveys on 10 different archetypes. That was internal, external, uh, daylight, nighttime, visual, thermal, plans, everything. We also conducted air pressure tests. And at the bottom, bullet point eight, uh, we did G-skin uh, U-value assessments. If you've never seen a G-skin before, it's from a company called Green Teg. It's about the size of a postage stamp with some little thin wires that go out to something that's about the size of a box of matches. But you basically stick the postage stamp on the wall, leave it for 72 hours, and when you come back and collect it, it gives you the U-value of the fabric. So all that data was then reverse engineered back into DREAM and all the calculations rerun again. To give us our definitive list of 100. That's what we want to do, we want to have 100 houses, let's retrofit them. This graphic's on the screen. I don't know why I did this, but a lot of people don't know where Aberdeen is down south. So um, it's on there for, for those who don't know where Aberdeen is. Apologise if it's um, a little bit patronising to any Scottish listeners. The pros and cons of this. Pro, we brought Aberdeen £5.5 million pounds of the funding. Con, it's taken an awful lot of learning for everyone because everything's been done in a PAS 2035 uh, compliant route and that's all new. There's been a bit of duplication with surveys. We've had architects on site, structural engineers on site, retrofit coordinators, IRT have been on site. I think if we were redoing it, we've learned an awful lot that it would be more streamlined next time. But ultimately, the we brought about two and a half million pounds of the funding to Aberdeen uh, and about two point something uh, from Bayes and a little bit from, from Aberdeen themselves. So what does DREAM actually do? DREAM is a SaaS-based uh, tool, that's software as a service, uh, which means you don't need to buy licenses, there's no modules to buy, there's no physical software. You basically log into the internet, to type in the website address, type in your password and you've got access to it. It's up in the cloud, which means it's, it's nice and scalable for us. So we basically hoover in as much data as you have on your assets. We aggregate and augment it. We then map it, model it, put it onto Google Earth and Google Streets, which incurs some costs. But we've mapped things like areas of deprivation, which is modelled in the top middle screen there. We've got the gas grid network mapped. We've got floodplain analysis fully mapped. We've got forestry commission data mapped. Uh, all sorts of um, different layers can be switched on and off very, very quickly and easily. But we've now got it to a point where you can just draw a polygon around an area, which is the bottom left screen. And when that polygon closes, it will give you detail on all the homes within the polygon. So it will say, look, in there, there are 5,822 houses that qualify for four million pounds worth of grants. And you can then break that down and, and slice and dice it in any way you like. 
Right now, that's a map of about 400,000 houses that were on the platform when I created this PowerPoint uh, a few months ago. But down the right hand side, you can say, look, show me just semi-detached off gas grid derated homes that qualify for funding in a Birmingham postcode. And it can break it down right down to address level and say, there they are. You can interrogate it again any way you like. You can say, but I'm interested in grant funding. So open it back up again, take all the filters off of it and show me where are the ones that I can grant fund. So if you are a housing manager or local councillor, whatever you happen to be, it's a really robust, easy way to, to find to find houses that qualify for funding where you can have the deepest amount of impact and raise the most amount of people out of fuel poverty optimally. This winter, we're going live with a vehicle with four thermal cameras on the roof, a LiDAR imaging system, hyperspectral cameras, air quality and noise pollution sensors all mounted in an EV. So that we can drive down the street and do data capture much, much faster than we can on foot. That's in its trial phase at the moment. It's not something we're, we're actively selling. We're just in the, the beta testing with it. The right hand side of your screen, I mentioned Dave Jones at the top of the call. Uh, Dave sold his company when he uh, wrote Grand Theft Auto 2, raised 112 million of investment, hired 900 programmers and mapped every building in Britain, America, Canada, Europe, Japan and the UAE in 3D. Um, it's an app, you can download it on your phone, it's called World without the O, just W-R-L-D. And it looks like a computer game, but you can use it as a, as a 3D sat-nav. What we've done with that, because it's graphics, you can re-render the buildings. So we made them like little white sugar cubes. Then we painted the buildings with three PCs, commercial and domestic. And then we can embed a decarbonisation pathway documentation into each building. We can build in the specification, photographs, reports, thermal images, everything can be built into it so that you just find a building, touch it, and you've basically got an online digital building passport a proper digital twin. A couple of final things to, to tell you about. There's only three slides left. Hopefully you're still awake. We have a platform called the Energy Dash. Uh, this is all available via our website if you visit irtsurveys.co.uk. E-Dash is the Energy Dashboard. Very simple uh, front end to SBEM. We've got about 250 dynamic templates uh, for commercial buildings. So you can phone up IRT and say, or log in and say, look, I've got a 5,000 square meter school built in 1976 in Essex. Um, it's got a flat roof. What do I do to it? You can type in its postcode and we pull in 25 years worth of weather data. You can then, you're pre-populating our templates with the basic data you have. So there's a, there's a raft of assumptions going on if you don't know things, but you can then stretch a template and the template stays a uh, ratio metric, if that's a word. So if you have a school, for instance, it, when you start stretching it, it won't make the classrooms bigger. It will increase the volume of classrooms, but it will keep the ratio of toilets and corridors and office space in line with the rest of the building. So you don't just end up with huge classrooms, but no office space or no toilets. It, it scales it in a sensible, methodical way. Once that's built, you can basically move sliders. You can say, look, what if I'm, what if I increase my wall insulation? What if I improve the roof? What if I change the windows, the lighting, the draft proofing, the heating efficiency? And as soon as you move that slider, it does an actual SBEM calc and the speedometers swing around to show you the, the savings. Once you have an account with us and you log into this, the EPC certificate becomes dynamic. So if you tell us the template information, it will say you've got an F. And again, we can pull in the, the actual EPC from the EPC register. The EPC then becomes dynamic. So you can drag and drop the EPC rating and say, look, I, my target is I want to get to a B. That's what the board have all agreed. We need to get a B on this, this building. When you click calculate, you've got a couple of minutes. On, on a hospital, you've maybe got time to make a cup of tea. But on a small building, it's almost instantaneous. But it gives you a roadmap that basically says this is where you are. That's where you said you want to get to. Those are the, the incremental things you need to do. And it, it 
accumulates the savings. So if it advises, look, let's start with draft proofing. It's very low cost. Do the lighting. That's low cost. It's easy. It's aggregating the savings and showing you the impact on the EPC as you go. And the report you download breaks it down into the ROI. So it will say year, year one, year five, year 10, year 15, year 20. So you can make uh, informed decisions on your retrofit journey ahead. And we have delivered this to 90 schools in Edinburgh. We've done it for 55 buildings at Manchester Metropolitan Uni. We've done it on about 14 buildings for Middlesex Uni. We've done it for Loughborough University. We did about 88 buildings for Royal Holloway University. And most of those, in fact, all of those projects I mentioned, all had thermal imaging bolted onto them. A couple of case studies for you as well. Just over the Christmas holiday period last year, we did about 13 buildings for Transport for London. They were all stations, all central London. But the objective was basically, what's the true condition? What should we do? And what's the, what's the ROI? And is there any grant funding available to help? Some of the surveys involved drones. Uh, the central London stuff, most of it was done on foot because the stations were in quite sensitive locations that were in no-fly zones. Um, Sky TV, similarly, we did about 20 commercial buildings. I think about eight or nine of them were in Scotland, in Livingston uh, and Dunfermline, and the rest were all near Heathrow. But they, they, I, think, I think Sky were the very first company in our 20 year history that phoned and said, we would like quantified thermal images via drone on our portfolio. Uh, I don't think anyone's, we've had to usually <laughs> uh, be proactive in creating those opportunities. They were the first one that phoned us out of the blue and said, this is what we'd like. Uh, so that was a, that was a tearful moment for me. Uh, we'd finally, finally broken through. Um, but the, the basic, the, the, the agenda was the same for both. It was basically, we don't know where we are, help. And they were done and delivered very, very quickly at about three and a half thousand pounds a building. So not, not a hugely expensive uh, service. We're in the home stretch, last two slides. Under lockdown last year, we took our DREAM app, which again is aimed at social housing providers. We basically thought, look, the general public are getting more into this, into the, the need for uh, retrofitting. So we turned it into an app. The app's called Hero. It's the Housing Energy Efficiency Retrofit Optimizer. Very cheesy. And if you've not figured, figured out that I like a good cheesy name by now with e and DREAM, oof, Maybe you need to rewind and, and start again. What Hero does is locate your phone, uh, sorry, locate your house from the location of your phone. It pulls in a photograph from Google Streets. It pulls in your EPC if it exists or looks two or three doors down from either side of your house to pull in your neighbor's EPC on the, the assumption that if your house was built in 1980, chances are your neighbors were built in 1980 but it's a bit hit and miss. It's better if you tell us. So we ask a few questions. How many bedrooms do you have? Is it detached? Do you know how old it is? Do you know the wall type? Do you know how much it's worth? It then uh, does calculations for you, does a bit of a grant search for you and says, look, you qualify for this, you qualify for that. We do have to ask you some GDPR questions about income to give you that answer though. But it lets you compare loans uh, via money supermarket. It can connect you direct to, to partners we have, but it can give you advice impartially and say, look, you need solar panels and loft insulation. You can then click a button and say, well, tell me more about solar panels because that's the thing I'd, I'd really like. And if those numbers stack up for you, it connects you to a Trustmark accredited local PAS 2035 certified contractor, and you can then book an appointment with them. And, and hopefully, they come out and, and fix your house and save you lots of money, uh, help end fuel poverty, help save you 50 pounds a month, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, that's it. Hero hasn't launched yet. We're, we're launching it with, with other partners. So you'll never see Hero as a, as a brand on the high street, but you might engage with the Tesco Energy app. And actually we're the, the data monkeys behind the scenes uh, powering it. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the, the last slide. I just want to thank you very much for your time and thank you to the, the good guys and girls at Proctors for inviting us along. And I, I think we're open for questions. Over to you.
Good morning. Welcome to our live Q&A session. A very warm welcome to you all, especially anyone who is joining us for the first time. My name is Carol Mikulak and I am delighted to have you with us this morning. I'd also like to say a very special hello to those who I had the pleasure of meeting earlier this week down at Offsite Expo in Coventry. It was so nice to see and speak to people in the flesh again. I hope you all enjoyed today's webinar, another fantastic presentation. Now, just to confirm the plan for this session, as always, we aim to stay on here and answer any questions that you would like me to put to our panel of experts. So feel free to drop anything into the YouTube chat feed, or alternatively, you can send us a direct message to our Twitter page at Proctor Group, or drop an email to webinar at proctorgroup.com. Now, if you do have to leave before we finish, or you think of something after you have left, don't worry, just get in touch by any of the usual means, leave some contact details, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. If you have registered for today's webinar, and you do still have time to do so if you've not done, you will get a follow-up email from us with a link in there, allowing you to watch back the full presentation and this Q&A session. There will also be details in that email on how you can request your own personalised CPD certificate. Do forward that email on to any friends or colleagues that you think might find it interesting and relevant. Again, if possible, please leave us some feedback and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you will get updates on all the things we are involved in, as well as details on future webinars. If you would like to discuss anything at all that we cover today in more detail, see any product samples or arrange a one-to-one -one meeting with any of the team, please get in touch. We love seeing what you're working on and help in any way that we can. As Kira mentioned at the start of the presentation, all our previous webinars are still available to watch back, both from earlier this year and last year. And these can be accessed either from the YouTube channel or on the Learning Hub page of our website, www.proctorgroup.com. Now, slight change for our next webinar, which will be taking place in three weeks from today instead of two. Friday the 15th of October at the usual time of 10 a.m., where we'll be delving into our Raptite Toolbox talk. This is one of the technical services that we offer, and we will be giving you an overview of the practical application of the Raptite self-adhesive air barrier membranes, performance benefits, and best practice for site installations. These toolbox talks have been extremely useful on a lot of large projects that we're currently working on in and around London. So please join us back here in three weeks where we will show you exactly how all this works and how it can benefit you. Okay, let's move on now to our Q&A session and let me introduce you to our panel. With me today, we have our technical director, Ian Fernington. Good morning, Ian. Morning, everybody. Next, we have our business development manager, Mark Lamborn, who some of you may also have seen down at Offsite Expo this week. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Carol. Morning, everyone. Next, we welcome back one of our technical advisors, Callum Anderson. Good morning, Callum. Good morning. And finally, I am super delighted to have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Stuart Little, who is the CEO of IRT Surveys and who gave us a wonderful presentation earlier. Good morning, Stuart. Good morning, Carol. I'm super delighted to be here too. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. Um, fabulous. Now, I can see quite a few questions coming in already. So as always, bear with me as I'm bringing them in from various different sources. OK, it would only be right, Stuart, if we start off with you as our special guest for today. This question has come in on the YouTube feed from Sylve Young. Sylve asks, can this apply to private homes or is it just social homes? It absolutely can apply to any, any building, uh, to be honest. Probably about 97% of the work we do is social housing, um, where we do it very cost effectively because of the volume involved. But um, we have done several homeowners uh, in the middle of the Scottish Highlands, in the middle of Hackney and Dorset, all over the place. Just tends to be a little bit expensive. That's the only downside. Excellent. OK, um, I'll stay with you, Stuart, if that's OK for this next one. Simon Wilson asks, how long does it take to thermally scan a building? 
That is a good question. There's a lot of misconceptions about that. If we do uh, mass volume surveys, it takes as long to thermally survey a building as it does to take a photograph with an iPhone. It's a matter of seconds. It's very low cost. It's a £20 per elevation service from us. But if you say, look, I own a big house, I want you to do the inside, the outside, daytime, nighttime, uh, thermals, visuals, create plans. It can be uh, probably about one or two hours to do a typical house, something like that. All depends on the service level. Absolutely. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, another one on YouTube. Ian, if I could bring this one to you this time from Marina Phillips. Marina says, I have an old house and want to improve the fabric, for fabric first method, but I don't want to strive for the lowest U value recommended for new build. Great. Um, well, yeah, there's lots of options that could be done when you're retrofitting a house. If you're doing it yourself um, or not going through planning permission, then any, anything you do is going to be beneficial. You should always strive for the best you can get, but obviously you've got to limit that with the ham principles of heat, air, moisture, movement. So you could strive for really good thermal insulation values, but that can affect something else in the in the dwelling. So if it's a, an existing building and you just want to improve it, then our wall liner that we provide can be very efficient. It's 13 millimetres thick with 10 millimetre insulation, 3 millimetre MGO board. Very effective in improving the wall, which can be arguably between 1.8 and 2.1 as a solid wall. And you can get that down to below 1 um, just with 13 millimetres. So that, that's a really useful area to do. Um, so, yeah, um, th there's lots of options. Obviously, our technical desk can help you with that um, and make sure that you've got the right balance um, in terms of heat, air, moisture. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. Um, if I could stay with you, Ian, for this next one that's come in on the YouTube chat. Um, Amir Azaya Khan says, I am currently researching the effects of moisture and relative humidity on the basement. And my question is, what strategy would be best to control moisture-related damage to old basements? And how can we retrofit it against moisture condensation? Well, basements is a really um, difficult one. <laughs> not, not difficult, it, it's unique in that you're, you're below the ground. So you've less windows, for example. So you can't just open the window and let that moisture escape. So basements are difficult um, in, in that sense that you've got to try and insulate it at the same time as make it waterproof. So where we're looking about breathability above ground, we're looking, do we look for breathability when you've got a solid stone wall and you've got to try and make it waterproof at the same time? Um, there is some, some dimpled uh, membranes that can help you convert your uh, basement um, and also dry line at the same time. But you have to be very careful with the moisture movement and, and the ham principles again in that situation as to making sure you've got enough insulation, but not too much that creates a problem elsewhere. So I think uh, Callum, myself, any of the tech days would be worth discussing with that further. Perfect, thank you, Ian. Okay. Uh Stuart, let me jump back to you. Um, there's lots of questions firing in on YouTube, which is fantastic. This one from Graham Mowat. When capturing thermal images, do you get better results during winter time when heating systems are more likely to be on? Uh, the short answer is yes. So basically for thermography to work, you need a temperature differential between inside and outside. And ideally you want a 10 degree difference. So if you can get the heating on, get the house up to 20, 22 degrees, and then do it that evening time. That's the best time to do it. So you can actually see the energy radiating from the facade. Caveat that with, you also need to be careful about solar gain, because if it's a nice sunny day, your building will absorb heat from the sun. So all the advice, we've been doing this for 20 years, and we find you have to do them about two to three hours after sundown. So you basically, if you, if you think of your building breathing, 
I, I like to think of it as it's inhaling energy from the sun, from the heating system, from the occupants, and all day it's just absorbing energy. Then it kind of holds its breath for about two hours because of thermal mass, and then it starts to exhale and radiate that um, energy about two hours after sundown. So heating on, low wind, no rain, low humidity, uh, low wind, uh, and a nice cold night. So it's a bit of a Goldilocks service in that regard. You can't just willy-nilly do it on a Tuesday just because. You've got to do it when the weather's just right. So every time someone orders a, a project with us, Carol, we always say to them, look, please understand that we don't control the weather. You can order it and say, oh, you've got to do it on Tuesday, but if it rains, we can't do it on Tuesday. We have to postpone it to Wednesday or Thursday. Especially, Sorry. especially in Scotland when it's uh, a little bit unpredictable sometimes. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, Mark, if I could bring you this next one that is in from Ricky Bobby. Ricky asks, what do you see as the challenges to achieve successful retrofit in domestic dwellings? Well, I think, as, as Ian has already mentioned, and I think those that are regular to, to our webinars will know that for many years we've been talking about uh, our hand principle. So, uh, as Ian said, this, this understanding of the balance of heat, air and moisture movement. So I think whether you're a building owner, um, design team or contractor, will we'll promote taking this holistic approach to, to building design. So I think if you look at traditional buildings, I guess due to the construction techniques that were used at the time, uh, they tend to follow these basic principles. But I think the challenges will come from the fact or, or arise, the fact that probably very few of these domestic buildings uh, or dwellings have remained unaltered over the years. So I think if you're looking to do a retrofit project, it's important to um, assess any historical alterations. So for example, this could include uh, chimneys which have been blocked uh, or removed, uh, the use of impermeable insulation materials or perhaps cement-based renders. Uh, and as Ian mentioned, what about basement or loft conversions um, or indeed double glazing? So I think particularly where traditional ventilation paths have been blocked, all of these will have some effect on that heat, air and moisture movement. So I think having a good understanding of any previous alterations or improvements will certainly help you achieve a more balanced sort of retrofit design. So I think that's the main, uh, one of the main challenges, as I say, is looking at uh, you know, what has been carried out previously by, by, by other um, people that were in that building before you. Perfect, thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, Callum, let's bring one to you, this next one on YouTube from Daisy Smith. Daisy says, are you better to insulate or apply draft proofing measures? Okay. Um, well, in, a, in an ideal world, the answer is both. Um, you want um, as much of each as you can, pardon me, as much of each as you can get. Um, really though, it depends, and this follows on from what Mark was just saying a minute ago, it, depends on what property has already had what, um, what it needs. Um, if you have a property that's really well insulated but has no air tightness at all, the insulation won't be doing much. You'll have so much air change that it will just be cold inside anyway. And on the other hand, if you have a property that's really airtight but has no insulation, then obviously that will be cold as well. Um, the SHDF recommends our fabric first method. So these are the right approaches to be looking at in, in terms of improving the building. Um, and those should be done before other new measures like new boilers, PV panels or heat pumps, um, so that you're not just effectively heating the space but pumping that heat out as well. Excellent. Thank you, Callum. OK, let's move on. Um, I have a couple of emails here. Mark, if I could put this one back to you. Declan Moore has emailed saying, what are the constraints with retrofit on heritage or historical buildings? Um, I think if, if the building is listed or in a conservation area, that there's going to be, of course, uh, planning constraints that you'll need to think about and consider. But I guess other historical or, or, or traditional buildings, they're, they're not going to be subject to that same level of uh, constraints with regard to the planning. But I guess um, if, if you're uh, a building owner, you should remain mindful of any uh, impact uh, of, of the works that you're going to be doing. So I think if we look at external wall insulation, um, for example, that can result in the loss of architectural details, such as decorative uh, masonry or brickwork. And, and then I guess if you're looking to internally upgrade uh, the building, then this can often result in, in features such as ornate plasterwork or mouldings uh, being covered up by uh, stud and track systems and plasterboard uh, insulation, etc. So I think, um, as Ian mentioned earlier, this is where our thin, high-performance aerogel 
or lining systems um, are useful. They can be specified when looking to balance any thermal improvement with preserving those, uh, the building's historic uh, features. So I'd, I'd recommend sort of getting in touch, uh, contacting the technical team and, uh, and understanding how we can help uh, with that type of system. Perfect, thank you, Mark. Okay, Stuart, can I come back to you with this one? Another email, this time from David in Peterborough. David says, where do you see data-driven design developing in the future? Well, that's a subject very close to my heart, uh, Peter. Um, we, we've actually uh, got digital twins of every single building in Europe available on an app you can download for free. It's, it's called World. It's just W-R-L-D, World without the O. We're, we're basically embedding decarbonisation pathways into that world. We're rendering the buildings with um, thermal imaging through a rapid uh, data capture vehicle we've got. The vehicle's got four thermal cameras. It's got LiDAR systems on the roof. It's got hyperspectral imaging. It's got noise pollution. It's got air quality, and it's an electric vehicle. So where we're taking it is we're literally driving down the streets, making measured 3D models of buildings with thermal images at the same time. And there's artificial intelligence built into the software that can tell us what the building's made of. This isn't an IRT invention. This came from a Horizon 2020, four million pound investment. But that vehicle can silently drive down the street and gather massive amounts of data and do like 20, 25,000 houses an evening. Then what we can do, back in 2006, we wrote software that quantifies thermal images. So we can then take those images and say, that house is wasting this much money, that much carbon, this many kilowatts. And then we can build in the retrofit pathway to it but as the previous questions um, alluded, we can't advise you on things like, look, this building's got listed planning permission constraints. It doesn't answer things like, do you have old shutters behind uh, timber? It doesn't answer things like occupancy. It doesn't answer moisture. But it is a digital way of scaling retrofits. We right now, we're sitting on access to £7 billion pounds of money to fully fund retrofits. So that there's, there's money there to do it. The banks are on board, the Green Finance Institute are on board, there are building societies and utilities that are ready to fund it. Um, everyone, everyone's getting there, but technology-wise to answer the question, we're trying to move the market from location, location, location to day to data, data, because we, we very much see it as a, sorry, I'm waffling quite a lot now. We very much see it as like sat nav, You've got to establish where you are honestly today and accept where you are today, then agree where you want to go tomorrow and optimise the route. So that's, we're basically, all of our software is about that. It's about letting maths drive the decision-making. If, if proctors say, look, that is a moisture risk because of the data, you need to trust that. If our software says that is a U-value risk, you need to trust that. So trying to drive it away from oh, but the boiler salesman was really nice, or the draft-proofing salesperson was lovely. Trying to move away from that into a more holistic, integrated, data-driven way, but digitize it. And that, that's where we, we kind of struggle sometimes when you show someone a thermal image and go, all your insulation's failed. It's kind of upsetting. It's bad news. They don't want to hear it. So there's quite a lot of burying your head in the sand at government level down to my house sort of level. Um, but we're trying to get, we're trying to address that, and hopefully with apps and things like that, we can help digitise that and move the move the game along. Excellent, thanks, Stuart. Uh, and just to confirm, you can scroll back to the sort of the start of the YouTube feed. We've put in links both for Stuart's website at IRT, but we've also put the World link in there as well. So have a look at that. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Callum, can I bring this next one to you? This has come through to us on Twitter from Rob S. Is there a way to prevent drafts in a timber floor? Um, yes. So you can apply membranes. You can apply membranes, for example, to a timber floor as you would any other element. Um, and in fact, Aberdeen Council recently did that on some of their social housing. They used our wrap type to prevent drafts, um, which was very successful. Fabulous. Wonderful. And get it, use it anywhere. Exactly. Okay, some, uh, some great emails coming in. Please keep them coming. It's fabulous today. Um, Ian, can I bring this next one back to you? 
Keith Jones has said on email, what about air tightness in older buildings? Um, good question. Air tightness in older buildings. Obviously, um, those of the, you that have watched a lot of the webinars in the past will have heard us talk about wrap tight on the outside of buildings for new build. Um, so, you know, this kind of wrap tight on the outside of buildings is very successful. And just as Callum mentioned, this is can be used underneath carpets there to improve the air tightness. If we're looking at an old building, um, 600 mil stone, then if you're going to get, insulate that, we do have a, a vapor control layer called ProCheck Adapt that can move um, depending on its moisture management. So it provides the air tightness, but it can move its dynamic uh, process by either opening or closing the pores to manage the building in terms of condensation risk. So we have a, a, a membrane called ProCheck Adapt, which is, is this membrane here. Um, and this can be used to improve the air tightness at the same time as moisture manage your building. Now, depending on the insulation that you use, you probably want to use an insulation that's uh, vapor permeable. And so it allows the membrane to work well. Um, but by doing that, it allows the building to stop the vapor in the cold. And then in the summer, allows the drying out of that membrane as you go through the construction. So it keeps the building dry whilst at the same time maintains it. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Okay, can I stay with you with this next one as well, if possible? Stevie on Twitter this time has asked, what about cold bridging in external walls where there are electric meters or sky boxes? Yeah, that's, that's probably one that uh, Stuart probably knows quite a lot about um, sky uh, dishes and, and condensation and moisture bridging there. So yeah, it, it is important to, to look at those areas. Now, the difficulty there is you may be using 100 millimetres of insulation, 150 millimetres of insulation, but then when you come to the boxes, you haven't got that space. Now, you need to take account of that. And what do you actually do in those areas? Now, our insulation that, that Mark mentioned earlier, our space therm insulation is very good for actually addressing those cold bridging areas. So you might not get the same as 150 millimetres of insulation, but you might get a little bit of insulation there to reduce that cold bridge. And whilst still on Stuart's um, thermographics, is it? Um, Oops, yeah. Would that be, <laughs> rather than pictures. Um, but that picture, that's like that thermograph, would actually show the potential cold bridging, it would still show up, but not quite as bad as it was. So we're looking at different systems for using behind there, where you're using external wall insulation. What do you do at the cold bridging areas? That's going to come into the new past 2035, where you need to do that. So we're working with people, looking at different systems to, to try and improve that position. Can I add to that as well, Ian? So we're doing a we're doing a five and a half million pound project up in Aberdeen at the moment. That is a an SHDF demonstrator project. Okay. That that question asked is on every single house we're treating. So we, we put twenty two thousand houses into our software. We found a couple of thousand that we could get to fifty kilowatt hours per square meter. Then through a process of filtration, we chose a hundred that were physically retrofitting. But then engaging with the tenants they've all got their own objectives as well. So we've had all sorts of things like, what about my pansies in the borders when you're putting up the EWI? And you, you kind of have to rein it in and go, look, you're getting 55,000 pounds worth of stuff for free. Your pansies are worth about a tenner. How about we move them and we put them back at the end and you know, hopefully they live. But you do have to consider the tenant in this role. The cold bridging thing, we, we've, we're experiencing things like, if we put EWI on the outside, 
the garage door can't open. If you've got a built-in garage, what do you do below it? Because the garage is cold, it's unheated. So we're having to take garage doors off and put roller shutters on the garages to free up space from an arcing door so that we can insulate the walls. But you do still then have a cold bridge where you might have aerogel on the inside of the garage so you can still open the doors of your car, but then 130 mil external wall insulation above the garage. So you have a cold bridge effectively between it. Uh, the, also the PAS 2035 recommends things like you have to take external wall insulation below DPC and take it all the way to the ground or it fails. Now we, we physically thermally imaged houses and this is a true story, I kid you not, where a client phoned us and said, please survey my house, my walls are squeaking. And we imaged it and there were rats living in the EWI. They had burrowed into it and the thermal images could see all the little nests and all the little babies all the way up the elevation because the insulation went all the way to the ground and it hadn't been uh, properly detailed. But I mean, you, you've all seen this before, EWI, when people cut around gas boxes, that's mainly because the gas boxes are owned by the utility companies and you phone them and say, we need to move 100 of them and they say, we'll put you in the queue, it's going to take six months. So the people just cut around them and leave it. You do get insulated boxes that go around them, but then if you've got a path around a, a building and maybe a disabled tenant or someone that needs access to with a wheelie bin, if they've got a concrete path going past this box, you then need to widen the path so they can still access their back garden. It's little things like that, but to answer the question, you've got to take all those satellite dishes off. You've got to remove rainwater goods. You've got to remove eaves. You've got to extend soffits. It's, 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 on the one hand, it's quite an exciting challenge, but you do have to really carefully consider it. And the retrofit coordinator role is vital, but already we're seeing retrofit coordinators just sign off photographs sent to them by a contractor rather than visit site. That we really need to stamp out and be all over that and properly police it to get it done right. Or we will just end up with more damp, cold, miserable houses, having spent 65 million making them better. Billion, rather. <laughs> Sorry, I answered that question far too long, Carol. Apologise. Not at all. I'm passionate about it, you know. You can keep chatting. I've actually got another couple actually for you, Stuart, that have come in on YouTube from Ben. He's asking, I think you might have covered this a little bit earlier, are the surveys restricted to winter time? Uh, not necessarily. When we do mass surveys, so if a housing association phones us and says, look, can you do 5,000? It's got to be winter time because we can't phone 5,000 people and say switch on the heating. But if it's if it's just one person's, yeah, as long as it's not raining and they can switch the heating on, we can do it. The, the alternative is to do it on a really hot day and be inside the building watching heat come in as opposed to heat going out. But our preference is to be outside because of couches and radiators and stereos and dogs and TVs and things. It's just easier to do it externally. And one other one from Ben, he's asking, will you be giving a presentation at COP26? I, I think I'm there. I'm on a couple of stands with the Net Zero guys, but I don't think I'm actually physically presenting. Glasgow may be presenting some drone surveys we did on 1919 tenements. We, we actually flew drones down um, about 500 tenements for them. But that... I'm going to waffle again. That started as a project to roll out electric vehicle charging points through lampposts. But the, the big sort of elephant in the room is there is insufficient headroom in the national grid to power electric vehicles. You can't drive home, plug your car in, go into your house, put the oven on, switch the telly on and boil the kettle. The grid falls, falls apart. It's already within about 5% of falling over. Um, so... We basically pitched them and said, look, we'll show you how to make the buildings 20% 20, 20 more energy efficient and that'll free up headroom in the grid. You can roll out EV charging. But what it grew into was, could you tell us how much lead has been stolen from the eaves? Can you tell us the profile of the gutters? Can you tell us how many cracks there are in our tiles? Can you tell us how many bolts are holding up the satellite dishes? Can you tell us um, things like how much stone is delaminating? Because uh, that, that's quite a big problem in the, the tenements. Um, I forgot what I started talking about there. It's a big problem, it's a big challenge, right? But it's not insurmountable. We just need the will to do it. Exactly. Okay, let's move on. Mark, let me come back to you with this one. We've got an email here from 
from Jamie. Jamie asks, what would your recommendations be to upgrade solid wall construction? Right. Um, well, I think Stuart presented a very interesting um, uh, obviously, uh, webinar presentation. Uh, and right at the end, he mentioned uh, heroes. And we know that not all heroes wear capes. So that brings in our technical department. So they provide a, a range of support services, such as U-Valley calculations and condensation risk analysis. So this service, I guess, is typically provided by your insulation manufacturer. And, and that, they'll, they'll tend to use the Glazier method. So this is a simplified uh, software package developed, I think, back in the 1950s and, and de designed primarily for lightweight construction. And it's used to assess condensation risk uh, in, in buildings. Um, for solid wall construction, I think any upgrade requires a more detailed hydrothermal analysis. Uh, and for this, we use um, a, a software package uh, called Woofy, which was developed by the Fraunhofer Institute. And that allows us to dynamically uh, predict moisture movement and storage, as well as condensation risk. Um, and, and talking of heroes, I think the postman's just been, so you can probably hear my dogs in the background. So, so this uh, detailed analysis takes into account the effects of uh, external weather conditions, I guess, such as driving rain, solar radiation, uh, and we can model the building to demonstrate any air or moisture leaks uh, at source, and we can act, act uh, accurately, I should say, uh, predict the drying out of that building fabric. So from all the conclusions of, of running that software package, it allows us to confirm, I guess, the most suitable thermal insulation for solid wall construction but also advise on the correct type and position um, from our range of high performance membrane systems. So um, again, as I said earlier, by all means, get in touch, um, talk to our technical team and uh, see what they can do to help you assess uh, solid wall construction. Perfect, yeah, as Mark says, we offer a huge range of technical services. So just get in touch and the team of heroes, as they certainly are, will be more than happy to go through anything with you. Okay, let's move on. I have another email here. Uh, Stuart, can I give you this one from Natalie Sneddon? Natalie says, how do your scans account for moisture or condensation? A very good question. Thermal imaging is not perfect. So things like, um, say you've got wet insulation in a cavity, the, a thermal image, they're called thermograms, by the way, and thermograms is the, the technical word. You, a thermal image won't tell you if, if, it's, if your building is red because of moisture or missing insulation. So you, you can be, you can set things like the relative humidity in a camera, but you have to measure it with another uh, device to actually say, look, it is 87% humid or it's 50% or whatever. Um, so the, the answer is, you, you kind of get used to with experience, you get used to what moisture looks like. Like if you go into a house, you sniff dampness with this bad boy, but then you switch on the thermal camera and you take a picture of it. And a thermogram, if it's condensation, usually reveals itself in the corners. You usually get a nice sort of pyramid sort of shape on the plasterboard if it's condensation. If it's slumping insulation, it often looks like, um, like icing on a cake from the outside, the way it pours over. Um, hopefully the images in the PowerPoint uh, would, would analyze that or, or answer that question. But the honest answer is you need other measures. You might need a boroscope, moisture meter, things like that to, to fully get to the bottom of it. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Callum, can I come back to you with this next one? Email here from Jacob in Carlisle who asks, when does the SHDF start? Oh, um, it's actually already started. So they did a demonstrator one run, which um, Stuart was involved in on a number of properties in Aberdeen um, that launched in October last year. And that awarded around £62 million to schemes across the country involving over 2,000 homes. Um, the current waiver funding opened on the, I think it was the 23rd of August, and that's going to run until the 15th of October. So um, registered, registered providers of social housing can still apply to um, be included in that. Okay, thank you, Callum. Um, okay, I've only got a handful more of emails that have come in here. So if anybody's still looking to ask anything, please drop it into the YouTube chat now or drop us a very quick email. Um, we don't want you to miss out. Callum, let's actually just stay with you for this next one from Jerry. Jerry says, you mentioned the PAS 2035. 
Could you expand on that, please? Um, yes. So that's a document that's, that was produced a few years ago. Um, it's designed to it's designed to provide guidance on retrofitting dwellings, um, and that's exclusively for improved energy efficiency. Um, any schemes that, that apply for the SD, SHDF um, funding would be required to use the past guidance. Um, and really it just details the requirements to assess and design implement design and implement retrofit works. Okay, thank you, Callum. Okay, Ian, let me come back to you with this next one. Ken in Dudley asks on email, can I, ins can I just insulate the external walls with no reveals done? Okay, um, is Stuart going to do a thermograph of it or uh, afterwards? Um, I think that's the problem. You could insulate uh, the, the, the wall and not do the reveals. Um, now, if Stuart comes in to do the present, to do the survey afterwards, he's going to write a damning report about the amount of heat loss coming through the reveals um, due to that. So you, you can do that, but research has also shown that you could put 140 millimetres of insulation in the walls and don't do anything on the reveals. Is the equivalent of doing 60 millimetres into insulation but insulating the reveals at the same time. So we have the research that the work's been done, but then we have Stuart afterwards verifying exactly what that is. So you should re insulate the reveals. Now, as it happens, Proctors have a window reveal board that can be used around the, the reveals, different uh, thicknesses. We've got insulation here. So you can use a plasterboard uh, with a plywood or an uh, MGO board. There's lots of different ways you can do that, but you can insulate that reveal. If you use the thinnest insulation, you can keep the, the windows still in there and you're not affecting that uh, problem. So, um, yeah, you, you should do it. Definitely do it. Um, and... and Ventilate those, uh, uh, sorry, insulate those reveals as best you can. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Okay, now I think this might be my last one, unless there's any just latecomers drop anything in. Stuart, if I could just give this one to you. Um, email from Brenda in Manchester. As a tenant in social housing, who would I speak to to benefit from this grant? The SHDF is only open to local local authorities in England. So you'd have to contact our, whoever owns our house, your local authority or housing association, and ask them if they're going for social housing DCAR uh, money. There are other funds available. There's Eco3, which would be via her utility company, uh, if you get in touch with them. But any local contractors in Manchester, um, companies like Cara down in Manchester, they'd be able to come in and, and give her proper advice and steer her. Um, there's a chap, Mark Byrne. It, it just a complete coincidence she's from Manchester because I was on the phone to him at half past nine. I would phone Mark Byrne at Cara and ask him to come and have a look. Um, but as, as it's a social house, the, the client would have to be the owner. So she'd be, she'd be well advised to go through her local authority. If the person's in Scotland, there's interest-free money available to every single one of us to do energy-efficient measures uh, on our houses. And it covers anything, uh, PV, batteries, air source heat pumps, insulation, all sorts. I've done it myself. I, I borrowed money. I borrowed £8,000 to put a battery in my garage and PV on my garage roof and run it into the house. And the, I'm getting all personal here, but that... The repayments on a 10-year loan for £8,000 is £65 a month, and my electricity bill is £56 a month. So in theory, by the time I turn 60, which is 10 years away, I shouldn't have an electricity bill, maybe? Or I've paid back the paid back the debt, certainly, and my, my energy bill, based on the summer that's gone by, my electricity bill has gone down about 60 70% because of the PV and the batteries. And I've shifted the load to charging the battery at night for two pence a kilowatt and then using it when it's 25 pence a kilowatt. So that that balance shifting the load and all that is quite quite exciting. But I, I to, to go back to your, the question you were asked, Ian, I like to think of energy as 
it, your house is a bucket with holes in it and the energy going into it is the water. So if, if you're going to fill it with nice, renewable, clean water, you might as well plug the holes in the bucket first, hence the fabric first approach. But if you don't do the reveals, that is the equivalent of sticking your finger in one hole and it just squeezes out another hole faster. So you need to plug all the holes. I think you'd, you'd be better doing thinner EWI and doing all the reveals than you would be doing thicker EWI and leaving a hole. It's the same as leaving a hole in a bucket. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Always great to get personal experience. That's when people know that it works, especially when it's you guys that are saying you've used it yourself. You know, we know it works. It's that old saying that, you know, if, if a chef eats from his own kitchen, you know it's good food. <laughs> okay, um, I think that's me. I've covered most of the questions or all of the questions, sorry, for today. Uh, there's been some great um, comments that have come in from people. Everybody's loving it today. I hope if anybody who has had to leave early gets a chance to watch back and see it, the interaction, it's been fantastic today. If there's anything that I have missed or you would benefit from a one-to-one -one discussion with any of us directly, please get in touch and we will get back to you straight away. Do register now for our next webinar taking place in three weeks time, which is our Raptite Toolbox Talk. Don't forget to give some feedback, leave a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. As always, huge thanks goes to you for joining us. Your feedback and involvement is what makes this all worthwhile for us. And we truly do appreciate you taking part. So all that's left for me to say is thank you to the amazing team that are behind the scenes here for pulling all this together and for the support that they give us both during the live feed and in the lead up to everything. Thank you to my fantastic panel today and especially to Stuart for his presentation and for taking the time out to join us on the panel. So from all of us here in front of the camera and behind the scenes, thank you once more for joining us. Take care, look after each other and have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>